OK, good afternoon and uh, welcome to this meeting of the conveners group. Um, I've received no apologies. Uh, I think we're waiting for a colleague, um, but I'm sure she'll be along shortly. This meeting is in public uh, and your microphones will be operated automatically. I welcome the, I welcome the First Minister uh, to the conveners group. Um, the meeting will be around uh, an hour and a half. We've agreed to focus today on the Scottish Government's uh, programme for government, but inevitably uh, conveners will want to touch on other more general issues, um, so I will be applying the usual leeway to allow that to happen. Um, uh, some conveners have indicated they wish to uh, raise more than uh, one issue, uh, and I'll do my best to call uh, all conveners uh, at least once, um, and in order to get through as much of the business as possible and to allow for those supplementary questions, I would um, ask for brevity in both questions and responses as far as possible. As with the previous meeting with the First Minister, it would be helpful if we could start with some uh, general issues of interest to the committees before moving on to the more specific ones falling under the programme for government. I therefore start with some questions around transparency and accountability. And I invite uh, Martin Whitfield, Convener of Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments uh, Committee. I am very grateful, um, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. You may be glad to know I only have one question sort of lodged. Um, which means I'll take about 45 minutes over it. I think that was the agreement. Um, and my question is in relation, really, as I'm sure you will expect, about the scrutiny that this Parliament can give the Scottish Government, which I know you have indicated in the past that you very much welcome. But in particular, I was going to ask you about um, the committee system that we operate here, because obviously... <coughs> The committee system is the backbone of the process of holding the government to account, the scrutiny of bills and other items, and it is the intention of uh, my committee to look at some depth into the work of committees, um, probably principally in relation to bills, um, and really it was just to give you an opportunity um, to firstly put on the record, I hope, your confirmation of agreement of the importance of that element of our system in um, the Parliament, but also to say whether you have any concerns at the moment about the committee system. Um, can I thank uh, Martin Whitfield for the question? Can I thank uh, uh, you, Convener, uh, for the opportunity to be here today? Um, I will also try to keep my answers uh, brief, uh, given, as you may be able to tell, I am battling a very serious case of the man flu, uh, as things stand, but I'll do my very best to, to power through. Um, can I say, in, in relation to Martin Whitfield's uh, question, I'm very interested in the work of the committee, very interested. Uh, indeed, our, our party, our parliament, I should say, uh, is, uh, of course, still a very young parliament. And uh, it's right that its procedures continue to evolve. And in fact, just after the back of uh, summer recess, we know there's uh, been some tightening up of uh, the time taken for questions and answers, for example, so we can get more questions and more scrutiny of the government, which is, which is something I uh, absolutely welcome. So sh we should, uh, as a parliament, be absolutely open uh, to continual uh, evolution. Um, as a government, uh, we'll cooperate fully with uh, the uh, work piece of work uh, from uh, the committee. I think the committee system has absolutely got its strengths. Uh, we can see that in terms of uh, how committees, committees around this table have significantly influenced legislation. Uh, often ensuring that the government compromises and makes compromises uh, where it can. Um, but I absolutely am open for any discussions, proposals on how that system uh, is improved. So when there are specifics, uh, I can give an absolute guarantee to Martin Whitfield that we'll engage uh, constructively. There may be some recommendations that we agree with, some that we disagree with, uh, but we'll be upfront uh, about that. But um, uh, I certainly welcome uh, that piece of work from the committee. I'm oh, grateful. Thank you. I am now going to invite Kenneth Gibson, Finance and Public Administration Committee. Thank you very much, Convener, and uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, my question is a very straightforward one uh, with regard to budget transparency. At present, during budget debates, members often quote different figures like apples and oranges in relation to whether spend has increased or decreased. <coughs> in the interest of transparency, will the Scottish Government present? alongside the Scottish budget, details of what was actually spent the year before the current year, details of what is being spent in the current year, and what the planned spending will be in the next financial year, so that Parliament can accurately compare this information. Uh, so I'm very open uh, to that. I think this is a point that uh, uh, Kenneth Gibson has made on, on a couple of occasions, and it's, a, it's a, I think, a very fair challenge uh, to us uh, indeed. And, and we want to be as transparent as we possibly can. I'm very proud 
of uh, the decisions we've made in, our, in relation to our budget and particularly in relation to progressive uh, taxation. So I'd be very open uh, to doing what we can to publish that level uh, of detail because I think uh, Kenneth Gibson is absolutely right. Transparency uh, will absolutely help uh, in relation to uh, some of the, the, the arguments that are made around our budget and around taxation. Thanks very much. I'm now going to invite uh, Edward Mountain, Convener of Net Zero Energy and Transport Committee. Thank you, Convener. Um, good afternoon, First Minister. Obviously, how we achieve net zero is critical to the remit of the Net Zero Committee. Can you explain how you will show the government's aim to reach the net, their net zero budget in a bill, and when the first bill will be where this is shown in detail so that it aligns with your government's objectives? So I think, um, first and foremost, uh, I would say that, uh, of course, we're committed to producing our climate change plan. We have to do that. Uh, of course, the Cabinet Secretary stood up last week on the back of the UK government's uh, announcements that we will have to, that, may, that may well have an implication for when we produce that plan, because we have to understand what the impact is of UK government uh, announcements on our own plans, particularly in relation to uh, electric vehicles and phasing out of petrol uh, and diesel uh, cars. Uh, so the climate change plan will give some detail of how we intend to meet those targets. Um, in terms of uh, future uh, budgets, of course, in our budget uh, at the end of this year, uh, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance will make it really clear how we intend to invest uh, in our net zero uh, commitments that will help us to, to achieve uh, our net zero uh, targets. Okay, First Minister, you mentioned the climate change plan, um, and I'm aware of what the Cabinet Secretary said uh, last week. <coughs> it was the, uh, probably the most open secret in this Parliament that it wouldn't be produced by Christmas this year, which was when it was forecasted. So my question to you is, when will it be produced, and will it be produced in time to allow the Climate Change Committee to have full uh, sight of it, uh, before they do that and your report to this Parliament? So it would certainly be the intention to give uh, the Climate Change Committee uh, as much uh, notice uh, uh, as we possibly can. I don't think it was inevitable that it was going to be delayed. It's not my, uh, not my reading of the situation. I can see uh, Edward Mountain has a, a different view uh, of that. But I mean, in all seriousness, we have to understand the implications, uh, particularly around uh, the phasing out of petrol and diesel uh, vehicles. I think Edward Mountain would, would accept that, that uh, if the UK uh, government has a different position, uh, then uh, what does that mean for, for example, the Internal Markets Act? What does it mean, for example, for those who may purchase a car from down south and, 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 and therefore uh, but, but be used it in Scotland? What are the implications um, of that? But what I want to say unequivocally is our position remains that we will not shy back from our own commitments. We're very committed to the various different timetables and milestones that we have to meet our interim targets. Uh, I want us to be seen as a climate uh, leader, um, and I think that's in quite stark contrast to what we saw from the UK government uh, last week. So we have no intentions of rolling back. I think uh, the committee that Edward Mountain uh, chairs does a, a very good job of holding the Scottish government to account uh, in relation to the fact that uh, we haven't uh, met uh, those targets recently and uh, narrowly missed uh, the last set of targets uh, that came out. So uh, there is a job for all of us to do in ensuring that Scotland continues to show that level of leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Convener. Thanks very much. Uh, and uh, now to <coughs> Richard Leonard, Convener of Public Audit Committee. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, First Minister, when you attended the Conveners Group in May, you said that you would, and I'll quote you, absolutely commit to reviewing and examining what more the government can do to be as transparent as possible. So can you tell us three things that you've reviewed and examined over the last four months? Uh, so I don't have a list of the things that we've examined. One, one aspect I've asked the uh, Minister for Parliamentary Business to look at and engage uh, with even external stakeholders is how we uh, ensure that we are meeting our, uh, our obligations to, to written uh, parliamentary questions and FOIs. Uh, I know there's been some uh, consider, considerable uh, external commentary as well as internal commentary in this parliament around uh, what more we can do in relation to meet those targets around freedom of information requests. So I've asked the Minister for Parliamentary Business to look at that. Um, and, and there was a serious need for us. There was long-standing long, there was long -standing, uh, FOIs that hadn't been answered 
and I delegated, in fact, made it a point to, to discuss in Cabinet uh, how we quickly respond to those outstanding freedom of information requests um, and also in parliamentary uh, questions. I suppose the third thing, if I was parliamentary questions, I suppose the third thing was in, 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 in during the course of the summer there was a fair bit of uh, understandable media attention on uh, credit card purchases from the Scottish Government, so I asked the Permanent Secretary uh, to look at the processes and that's still under uh, underway. I've had, uh, I think, an initial uh, response back from the Permanent Secretary uh, on his examination uh, of credit card purchases from the Government and how we ensure we're transparent and, of course, that any, any spend uh, that is being made is appropriate. So those might be three areas, but I'm sure there's certainly more uh, that uh, we have done in the, sp in the space of the last four months, which I'm happy to write to the convener, and that can be passed on uh, to, 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 Mr. to Mr Leonard. Um, <coughs> last, last week, the Public Audit Committee took evidence from uh, Transport Scotland on the Barry Smith KC inquiry. In the interest of transparency, will you publish today the terms of reference for that inquiry? Uh, I'll certainly look into uh, if we're able to do that. Um, so I will, I, will, I will explore if that is possible to do. I mean, I genuinely believe, uh, particularly on uh, the issue that uh, Richard Leonard raises, we should be as transparent as we possibly can uh, be. So I will, I will certainly look into that and uh, come back to committee if we're able to publish the terms of reference. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Uh, we now move on to the Verity House Agreement, and I'm going to invite uh, Ariane Burgess, Convener of the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee, to take forward the questions uh, in this section. Thank you, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. Good afternoon. Um, so this is a question around government accountability. The committee welcomes the progress being made toward a new deal with local government as set out in the Verity House Agreement. With this significant devolution of power to local government, how does the First Minister envisage the role of national government changing and how will Parliament be able to hold the government to account for delivering on shared priorities when so much decision making will rest with local government? First Minister. Uh, I think it's an exceptionally important question. Um, I'm really grateful to Ariane Burgess for, for asking it. So the Verity House Agreement, uh, for me, it was exceptionally important to get over the line in the first um, 100 days. I think it's f safe to say that the relationship between national and local government could be could have, could be improved, and I'm pleased that the Verity House Agreement is a demonstration of our desire, collective desire, to improve that relationship. And I very much uh, believe in the spheres of government as opposed to the tiers um, of government, and very uh, much believe in uh, national, well, sorry, local uh, by default, national by exception. I think um, for me there is a genuine question um, which calls absolutely accept uh, around accountability and ensuring that as we loosen, for example, ring fencing, that there's a shared understanding of the outcomes that we each want to achieve and how are we each held to account for those, uh, the, achieving, the, the, the achievement of those outcomes. And that's why, uh, having signed the Verity House Agreement, that is the very beginning of the process. Uh, there will now be a period of quite a number of months, and, and actually it may, as we go through it, even, even take years, um, to ensure that there is the appropriate mechanisms in place to, to, to be able to scrutinise those outcomes. Uh, one of the key areas that we're working on with COSLA at the moment is the accountability uh, framework. It's being very much developed in partnership with our friends and colleagues in local government. Um, I fully intend that uh, that accountability framework be shared with Parliament um, and with uh, bodies that uh, hold local government to account uh, as soon as uh, practical. So that work is very much um, underway, and I think that uh, that accountability framework will be important so that government, sorry, forgive me, so that Parliament can hold um, national government uh, to account in relation uh, to those outcomes. Thanks very much. Thanks, Arianne. Uh, and I'm now going to move on to Paul <coughs> Stevenson, Convener of Social Justice and Social Security. Um, thanks, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. And still focusing on um, the Verity House Agreement, um, particularly in child poverty, and I know that's something that's high on your agenda coming from the last programme for government. So how does the Verity House Agreement affect the Scottish Government's approach to tackling child poverty? I think, I think ultimately it, we both have a shared endeavour to tackle child poverty. Certainly in my discussions with COSLA, uh, it is uh, an issue of uh, the highest priority uh, for them, and uh, we're both committed 
uh, to that. And I think that's where the accountability framework is going to be really important. So we can all talk at very high levels around what we want to do to tackle child poverty. Uh, they can, uh, the member will be very aware of, uh, of course, the, the targets uh, that we have set ourselves, very ambitious targets, uh, the four targets around poverty uh, that we have set ourselves uh, as a government. Um, so. Uh, the agreement that we have in place, the Verity House uh, agreement, it very much sets out those principles about how we will collaborate together to tackle poverty, um, and it's very much central to the Verity House um, agreement. Uh, COSLA uh, and SOLACE, uh, bodies that are uh, SOLACE and are well, well known uh, to conveners, uh, they're very much represented on our Child Poverty Programme Board. Um, as well. So the accountability framework will give in a very transparent way detail of the outcomes that we're hoping to achieve, how we can be held to account uh, in relation to that. Um, and uh, I can give an absolute assurance to the member that uh, child poverty is a shared uh, endeavour and shared priority between ourselves and, and local government. It seems that my man flu may have spread uh, to <laughs> others, which I'm very sorry about. Okay, Collette, Thank you. Okay, we're going to move um, into some of the broad areas covered by the programme for government, and we're going to start in the area of uh, economy. And I call uh, Claire Baker, the convener of Economy and Fair Work Committee. Claire, um, thank you, um, President Officer. So today, the sorry, First Minister. Today, SNEB published their annual accounts, um, and the recorded losses largely attributed to circularity in Scotland. Can I ask what lessons the government have learned about the influence of government policy on bank decision making? When we had Willie Watt in front of the committee uh, before recess, um, he did say the bank would be reflecting on the process that was undertaken to uh, give out this, this loan. So there's a number of uh, things to unpack, I think, in that, in that question. First of all, um, having met uh, Billy Watt, having met the, the Chief Executive uh, Al Denham of uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank, I think they're doing a very good job. I think they're, uh, it's not unexpected that they would, uh, this phase of the bank's um, life uh, cycle, that there would necessarily be a level of loss. I don't think it's completely unexpected, given that, um, of course, the Scottish National Investment Bank, one of the things it's tasked with doing is de-risking investment, particularly when it comes to net zero, particularly when it comes to new and innovative technologies. Uh, when I speak to business time and time and time again, they talk about helping to de-risk uh, their investments and a greater appetite to share risk. Um, and I think that's that's right, particularly when it comes to, to, to new technologies. So that's got to be a calculated risk. It, it can't just be uh, cavalier, and I believe it is a calculated risk that is taken by uh, the Scottish National Investment Bank. And, and Scottish Government, of course, has to allow the Scottish National Investment Bank to use its expertise to decide um, how, where, where to invest um, the, 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 the funding it has. Uh, and, and, of course, they've done a good job in, in leveraging a significant private investment uh, in that regard. In terms of uh, lessons uh, learnt in relation to the deposit return scheme and, and circularity uh, Scotland, um, there are a number uh, of lessons undoubtedly uh, to learn. Um, and I'm happy to give a very detailed uh, written uh, 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 correspondence to, to Claire Baker. But what I would say uh, is that it's a source of great frustration. I mean, we. I won't go over all of the history of where we are uh, with the deposit return scheme and where we've ended up. Um, but again, the Prime Minister's most recent announcements give me uh, little hope uh, at all that there will be a, a UK aligned scheme by the time that the UK government had suggested there would be in 2025. Um, so we've had our own scheme virtually torpedoed and no UK scheme, scheme uh, I don't think, uh, in sight. So I think it was right that SNIB uh, invest in. It was a decision, obviously, for them to invest in circularity uh, Scotland uh, at the time. Uh, I'm just frustrated uh, that we have ended up in the position uh, that we are in and unable to take forward a Scotland-only scheme that was ready to go uh, and, and would have, I think, uh, been very helpful in relation to reducing litter uh, on our streets. Thank you. Um, the committee will be following up these questions with um, SNIB ourselves. The other issue in relation to SNIB was the legislation that established the bank uh, was very clear in its expectations around gender um, inequality in the financial sector. And the government do have a number of commitments around women and enterprise. Um, in the discussions you've had with the chairman and with the bank, do you make it clear the expectations from government and from parliament 
that they will be addressing gender inequality and supporting women within businesses, and they will be recognising the range of businesses that women in particular are invested in. Uh, yes, and, and, and th that those discussions uh, that will be reiterated in uh, most of the discussions that we have uh, with the Scottish National uh, Investment Bank, but also with other stakeholders, um, as well as in a meeting with representatives of the financial uh, sector as part of our, our, our FISGAD uh, group that we have. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to say, of course, there was uh, a number of, of women from the financial sector industry uh, they represented, but more importantly, an agreement by that group that there's more work to be done uh, in this regard. And uh, of course, I know Claire Baker will know about Anna Stewart's uh, excellent work uh, that she has done on women uh, in entrepreneurship. We are very committed to taking forward the recommendations in Anna Stewart's excellent uh, piece of work. Uh, and we have made some considerable progress when it comes to uh, uh, the, the, the support uh, that we're offering, uh, able to offer women uh, in uh, entrepreneurship uh, into, into work. And it's why a key commitment of my programme for government um, was to ensure that we expand our childcare offer because although that helps families in the round, we know it disproportionately impacts uh, in a positive way uh, women and, and women's ability to get back into the workforce, which is good for women, good for families, uh, good for the economy uh, as well. Is there time for another question? <coughs> briefly, yes. Uh, briefly, just about the Fair Work um, sectoral agreements. So the mandate later to Neil Gray did highlight the Fair Work sectoral agreements. Just appreciate an update on where we are with those, maybe particularly retail, as we did an inquiry into town centres. Yeah, again, I'd probably be better writing to the member on more of uh, the detail, but that's exactly why uh, I found it important to raise that issue explicitly within the mandate letters, which is, of course, a new... Uh, new uh, 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 it's an innovation uh, that I've uh, brought forward in order to ensure that all of the cabinet secretaries in my government are focused uh, in terms of uh, delivery. I do know about the town centre uh, inquiry uh, that has been uh, done and the report, of course, that you published at the end of uh, last year. And uh, we're very much keen to continue to work with COSLA around the town centre uh, action plan and um, uh, solidify uh, multi-year funding, long-term funding for town centre regeneration in Scotland. So um, I'm happy to write to the member with more detail around some of the specifics that she asks uh, in that regard. Thank you very much. Sticking with the economy th theme, I'm going to invite back in Kenneth Gibbs. Kenneth. Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, funding public services requires a thriving and growing economy. So what is the Scottish Government's long-term economic growth strategy to deliver fiscal sustainability in light of the huge demographic challenges we face and a fiscal gap of around £1 billion, as highlighted by the Scottish Fiscal Commission? Uh, we could spend um, hours uh, answering that question. I won't, of course, uh, as I can see, uh, as we don't have time. And, and again, if there's anything that Kenneth Gibson uh, wishes in terms of specifics to follow on, we'll, we'll always uh, be happy to provide further detail. Uh, I would, uh, and I know Kenneth Gibson is very familiar with NSET, our national strategy for economic uh, transformation. That's at the very heart of our economic uh, growth strategy. I was very clear in the programme for government. It was both an anti-poverty and pro-growth. Uh, program for government. Um, there's a number of uh, areas that we will look to invest in. Uh, Scotland, uh, I believe its uh, economic growth um, uh, will be powered by uh, our net zero opportunity. It's an incredible opportunity in relation to renewables, but we are blessed as a country with a number of sectors uh, of great abundance. Um, our food and drink offer, we know whisky exports, for example, for the first time broke through the £6 billion barrier. Uh, we know our life, uh, life sciences uh, uh, sector uh, is growing, our space sector uh, booming. Uh, a number of industries uh, in Scotland, uh, agriculture, hospitality, tourism, um, are great uh, avenues, uh, for, uh, great, great, great opportunities to continue uh, along our path uh, in relation to economic growth. Um, Kenneth Gibson is absolutely right to make mention of the demographic challenges, and it's a source of uh, a great worry and concern. If, I, if there was something that gave me um, endless sleepless nights, it's that demographic challenge and workforce challenge that we're facing. I think every single sector I talk to, 
excuse me, both public and private sector uh, share with me concerns around that demographic uh, challenge. So what are we doing to try to resolve it? Uh, a few things. Uh, I would commend uh, in detail, uh, I would commend the detail of uh, James Withers' review in relation to skills. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. government is, of course, uh, seeking uh, to uh, ensure that we take forward a number of the recommendations uh, in James Withers' uh, review in relation to skills, because that is clearly going to be important for us to understand the workforce of the present and the future and how we fill those gaps that clearly exist. Um, we will continue uh, in relation to, to, to trying to attract talent from across the UK and our talent attract, uh, migration attraction service will be important to that. And Although we obviously do not have the powers over uh, migration, we will do what we can to ensure that Scotland is, a, is an attractive a place as possible and work with others to put forward sensible propositions to the UK government around, their, around how their migration uh, uh, challenge, how, how, how their migration policies can better suit our, our needs. And the very last thing I would say is uh, there is there's areas, when it comes to depopulation, there are areas and parts of the country where we have a real concern, remote rural island communities, and that is why we are, for example, producing a variety of different plans to tackle those depopulation issues and housing uh, very much at the heart uh, of those uh, plans. Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, it's obviously a huge area. I mean, I, clearly a focus on skills, innovation, startups, and research and development would certainly uh, um, be of assistance. But I want to move on to my second question, which is on taxation. And the Finance Committee <coughs> uh, heard in a pre budget 24 25 evidence that both the United Kingdom and Scottish tax systems are complex and disjointed, with no clear progressivity in either. For example, the marginal rate of tax due to the interaction of income tax and national insurance, and of course national insurance is not devolved, is actually higher in Scotland for someone earning £44,000 a year than someone earning £54,000. So what is the Scottish Government's long-term taxation policy to provide certainty for taxpayers, uh, progressivity, uh, and ensure that uh, potential investors and our public services uh, can see into the future as to what their taxation policy is likely to be and therefore how it will impact upon them. First Minister. So again, there's so much to, to unpack in that uh, question from Kenneth uh, Gibson. I, I suppose I would start by saying I'm, I'm not convinced or certainly don't agree that we haven't shown our progressivity. I think we have a progressive tax system. Uh, in Scotland, I'm very proud of that progressive uh, tax system. Of course, we have to be mindful of national insurance contributions, and frankly, we also have to be uh, very mindful of what decisions the UK government makes in relation to taxation. Um, we're very alive and alert to the divergence which exists, and I uh, don't have an issue with that divergence. Uh, because uh, uh, it, it certainly demonstrates uh, our progressive taxation system, but we have to be mindful because, of course, if it gets to a certain point, there could be behavioural impacts uh, that could be to our detriment, and, and we, we ensure that there is appropriate analysis and modelling uh, done in that regard. But I, I, I don't flinch away from or shy away from uh, the values uh, of our taxation system, which uh, essentially boils down to those who uh, earn the most uh, should pay the most. That's not something um, that I'm scared of uh, unashamedly and explicitly uh, putting on uh, the record time and time uh, again. So we will, uh, and we do believe in a progressive uh, tax system. I believe it was the IFS that said um, due to our tax and uh, changes that we've made in relation to social security, um, that those uh, households in the 30% lowest income households with a child are better off to the tune of about £2,000. That's, that's, that's uh, uh, I think, uh, testament to the decisions that we've made, both in terms of taxation and also in terms of social security. In terms of the question of how do you give certainty over the longer term, it's a very reasonable question uh, for Kenneth Gibson, of course, uh, to ask. It is a difficult one to answer because, as Kenneth Gibson has already said in his question, some of the factors which influence what we will do with taxation don't lie with us. National insurance, you mentioned. Uh, of course, the UK government's own tax policy, if they choose to, uh, as they did with uh, Liz Truss's mini-budget, cut tax um, for, 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 for uh, the wealthy, um, then, then we have to be understanding and mindful of that. It doesn't mean we'll change course. Of course, we didn't change course during the mini-budget, and we're right not to change course uh, during the disastrous mini-budget. Um, but, of course, we have to be mindful of what the UK government uh, does in that regard. But uh, our central uh, 
um, our central uh, driving ethos will be a progressive tax system so we can invest in our public services. And the Scottish Fiscal Commission, of course, do say that uh, because of the taxation policies we brought forward, we have in around about a billion pounds to spend and invest in our public services. Okay. Apologies, I'm going to have to move on. Um, <coughs> move on to the issue of constitution, and I call Claire Adamson, convener, Constitution, Europe, External Affairs and Culture Committee. Claire. Thank you, convener. Good afternoon, First Minister. The programme for government includes an ongoing policy commitment to align with EU law. Previously, this was qualified as appropriate, but is now qualified as being where possible and meaningful. The scale of this task is um, very familiar to everyone sitting around this table today, uh, and our committee has published an EU tracker that will help committees in their scrutiny process. But can you confirm that the policy commitment as set out in the Continuity Act Statement of Policy is that Scottish Minister's default position is to align with EU law, and how will the Scottish Government support the committees in scrutinising these decisions? First Minister. I mean, that, that is absolutely uh, the policy uh, position around uh, alignment where we can and where is possible. Um, we have to also be up front, uh, and, if, and I think we have been around where the limitations are uh, in that regard. Um, and, uh, but we absolutely uh, wish to continue alignment as far as we possibly can. Uh, in terms of uh, transparency, I'm happy to uh, continue to liaise with Claire Adams and our committee. If there's anything further we can do in our own transparency uh, of uh, alignment, uh, but in my recent visit to Brussels, I made it very clear to every single EU official that I spoke to that we want to continue uh, that alignment uh, so that when the day that Scotland does rejoin the European Union, uh, that should help with that uh, application uh, process. I also think it's the right thing to do because of the high standards the EU uh, often applied to a number of areas, so I don't want to see us uh, moving back from that um, wow. one, one single bit, but I'm more than happy to continue our discussion with, <coughs> excuse me, with the committee um, if there's anything further we can do in around being uh, more transparent around, uh, around that uh, particular piece of work. Cliff, thanks very much. Okay, we now move on to a um, broader theme um, under the heading Children. Um, I'm going to invite Cocab Stewart, uh, Convener of Equality, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee. Cocab. Thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, First Minister. Um, the new UNCRC rights will only apply to acts of the Scottish Parliament and uh, not to Westminster legislation or any amendments that Holyrood has made since. Um, this will obviously put out of scope uh, key acts, including the Children's Scotland Act of 1995, Education Scotland Act um, as well. So what does this mean practically for children in Scotland in terms of the UNCRC bill? Well, I suppose practically it means that we won't be able to give them the full range of coverage that we would have hoped to have done so uh, with the incorporation of UNCRC. Um, there will be many existing acts of the UK Parliament uh, in uh, areas, involved areas that impact on children rights that will not be subject to the compatibility duty um, in this bill. <clears throat> and of course we, we have to, uh, we had to have made the amendments uh, to the legislation in a way that addressed the findings of the UK uh, Supreme Court and, and try to reduce so far as possible the risk of any further legal intervention uh, from the UK government um, and at the same time create legislation that is coherent. In terms of the practical implication uh, of the adjustment of the scope of the duty, I suppose that will become clearer uh, over time once the bill has actually passed uh, and the duty itself commences. Um, so from a Scottish Government perspective, we'll continue to do what we can consider ways that we can support uh, children, young people um, and their representatives to understand the new laws mm. uh, and consider what, may, might, what can be done uh, within that legal framework uh, to increase its scope in the, in the future. Um, thank you, First Minister. So, um, yes, I suppose looking at the duties of uh, the scope on duty bearers <coughs> and uh, the, Im, you know, the implications and rights holders around that. But what work um, is the Scottish Government undertaking to consider how these changes to the UNCRC Bill will have to be drafted into the human, uh, Scottish Human Rights Bill? Mm. And again, what will this mean in practice for the people of Scotland? Well, that's very fair question indeed, we're, we're obviously very mindful of the uh, judgment from the courts 
and what implication that would have for uh, the Scottish Human Rights Bill, which I have to say, uh, speaking to very eminent uh, individuals like Professor Alan Miller, as I did a couple of weeks ago, there is great uh, global interest uh, in Scotland's Human Rights uh, Bill. But practically, of course, we will have to consider um, what the scope of that is. Um, the duties that are currently proposed for uh, that bill, they are different in nature to the compatibility duty in the UNCRC bill. Uh, they involve both procedural duties but also compliance mm. um, duties. So we will have to think carefully about the implications, uh, bearing in mind the nature of those duties. And the last thing I think any of us want is to go through the bill process only for there to be another legal challenge um, and, 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 and risk um, having to, to go through a reconsideration uh, phase and process once again. So I'm happy to keep the member. I'm, I'm certain uh, the committee will uh, be closely scrutinising um, the bill and happy to continue to liaise with her uh, on these matters. But it's fair to say um, we have to consider uh, the court judgment uh, when it comes to uh, what we're doing in relation to the Scottish Human Rights Bill. Thank you. Thank you, First Minister. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to <coughs> Sue Weber, uh, Convener, Education, Children and Young People Committee. Sue. Good morning. Uh, good afternoon, rather, First Minister. As you're aware, our committee has taken a great deal of interest in behaviour in schools and has written to the Cabinet Secretary on the matter in advance of the first summit which took place earlier this month. Relationships and wellbeing in our schools is something which is vitally important to our committee. And whilst we appreciate that there are summits being held, can I ask what support the Scottish Government intends to give teachers in the meantime to address the behavioural issues in our schools? First Minister. Well, I'm thankful for the work that the committee uh, has done in this regard and to the convener for um, the interest that she uh, has shown. And she is right that um, the Cabinet Secretary for Education has, of course, uh, continued to take these issues uh, up. Uh, we are liaising as per the uh, the Verity House Agreement, we're liaising with our colleagues in local government to see what more we can do to support um, uh, teachers and staff in relation to some of the concerning behaviour that we have seen. Uh, Sue Weber will also be aware that um, there is concern about uh, what the impact uh, of the pandemic potentially on uh, children and what that might have done in relation to behaviour. So we're very keen to understand what is behind what's the reasons that we're seeing uh, really difficult behaviours um, that have been the uh, focus of uh, political attention, uh, media attention and press attention. The other thing we're very, very keen to do is ensure that there is the appropriate uh, counselling uh, available um, pre-crisis interventions accessible to every single secondary school uh, in the country. So we'll continue to fund those interventions to understand the anxieties, concerns of our young people, which again I hope will help in relation to behaviours. Um, but the reason for the summit was to bring uh, a whole range of stakeholders, including political representatives, uh, to see what more uh, we could possibly do. So there is uh, detailed consideration being given in that regard. Thank you. I've got another question on a slightly different topic, First Minister. It's on the promise. So what will the Cabinet Secretary <coughs> on the promise announced in the programme for government be looking at? When will it meet and who will be involved in it? And what there's a lot of questions there, apologies. And what does the First Minister hope to see this group achieve? And the promise bill, when can we likely expect that? First Minister. So a, a number of things you're right in, in, in that question. Uh, we haven't uh, finally determined uh, the absolute membership of the subcommittee on, 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 on keeping the promise. Um, but uh, the entire purpose, of course, of that subcommittee uh, is to ensure that we have all of the appropriate uh, ministers, cabinet secretaries uh, and officials around that table, cross-government focus on not just keeping the promise, but delivering. Uh, the promise uh, to, in relation to what will its kind of overarching uh, aim be uh, in that regard, the overarching uh, aim will be to make sure that we keep the promise. That is uh, a commitment that we have made. Um, Sue so Weber is very aware of the challenge that the Oversight Board um, presented to the government, um, and, and we have to make sure we're back on track um, to meet uh, that commitment. Uh, in relation to uh, the interim commitments, but also uh, in relation to 2030. Um, we will, of course, as a subcommittee, take advice from, for example, the, the independent advisor, Fiona Duncan, 
uh, in relation to the to 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 the promise. Um, I don't have uh, detail of uh, when the bill will be ready uh, to bring uh, forward. That's still work uh, very much uh, underway. But I'm more than happy uh, to furnish Sue Weber with more detail, not just um, on uh, legislation, uh, but on the detail of the subcommittee uh, once we have it uh, underway. I should say uh, the work on the promise uh, doesn't uh, rely on the subcommittee being put together. We're making progress in relation to the promise, and we have, if we do take a step back, um, there is, uh, of course, uh, th there is noticeable progress that has been made in relation to the promise of fewer young people in care, for example, uh, within the care system, and that's something we want to build upon. So we won't wait for the subcommittee to necessarily take that action, but the subcommittee will bring a cross-government focus, uh, which I hope will be welcomed by all. Thank you. Sticking with the children's theme, I'm going to invite back in uh, Colette Stevens. Thanks very much, Convener. Um, First Minister, um, at our committee, we've just completed an inquiry into childcare and parental employment. So uh, it was a welcome announcement within the programme for government, a number of measures aimed at tackling uh, child poverty, including six local authorities to develop <coughs> childcare from nine months to end of primary school, pilots aimed at uh, recruiting 1,000 uh, childbinders and expanding the eligibility of uh, two-year-olds for early learning and childcare. So, do you feel that the childcare expansion is large enough and quick enough to have an impact on child poverty? First Minister. I think it's a really fair question. Um, and I would say that, uh, yes, I've got every confidence that not just the childcare expansion, but all of the um, all of the initiatives that we're bringing forward to try to tackle child poverty collectively will make a significant difference in relation to child poverty. Um, we have seen, of course, from uh, figures released um, in the last few months <coughs> that it is estimated through our work that 90,000 children will be lifted, are set to be lifted out of poverty uh, this year. Uh, we are not complacent about that. Um, we know there is more to do. Uh, we know that the very serious warnings from experts that we, uh, the government needs to do more to remain on track in order to meet our child poverty targets. Um, that's a, a challenge we take very, very seriously. So if I combine all of what we're doing in relation to tackling child poverty, uh, I'm confident it it's, it's certainly moves us in the right direction. Um, but it's why uh, the budget um, uh, that will, of course, be announced uh, to this Parliament at the end of this year, uh, I don't think I'm giving any surprises away when I say that there will be a significant focus on reducing poverty and child poverty in particular, and that will require some difficult decisions to be made around issues, potentially around taxation, around targeting our resources in order to ensure we um, focus on those that need it the most. Okay. Thanks very much, Colette. Um, <coughs> I'm going to move down the line to Audrey Nicholl, Convener of the Criminal Justice Committee. Audrey. Thanks very much, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. My question follows on from the Chamber debate that the Criminal Justice Committee led last week on tackling online child sexual exploitation. Um, stakeholders have described how the threat, complexity and severity of offending continues to grow and that tackling this issue goes beyond just one of law enforcement. And this week a three-day international conference is taking place here in Edinburgh to consider the global prevalence of child sexual exploitation. While taking evidence, the Criminal Justice Committee heard calls for the development of a sexual harm strategy for Scotland. However, to date, that has not been completed. Given the cross-cutting and complex nature of this issue, would the First Minister give further consideration to the development of an overarching sexual harm strategy, as highlighted by stakeholders who are working in this very complex space? I will, I will absolutely give uh, consideration uh, of that. I know this is an issue of uh, great uh, interest uh, and worry to members right across uh, the chamber, regardless of whether you're a parent or, or not. Um, and I can't think of anything worse uh, as a parent than uh, my child um, being exploited in, in, in that way. Um, I uh, know that, of course, the Minister, in relation to the debate that took place uh, last week, gave um, detail of our multifaceted uh, approach in relation to tackling child exploitation and child sexual um, abuse. Uh, we absolutely agree that there is a, a, it's a complex issue 
cross-cutting nature of evolving issues requires uh, a very strategic and, and coordinated approach. I'm also very keen to work with the UK government on this issue where we can. I think the UK government and Scottish government have worked well on issues such as human trafficking mm -hmm. uh, in the past. I'm happy to explore what more we can do on that uh, and, and, and in that regard. Um, in, in August, we did uh, advise stakeholders, as I think um, the member will be aware, of our intention to establish a new strategic advisory group to review uh, and further develop our approach to uh, preventing and tackling all, all forms of child sexual abuse and exploitation, uh, including, uh, and, and I know uh, Audrey Nicholls is very aware of this point, including, of course, uh, online uh, exploitation and abuse. So this uh, group will consider whether a national strategy uh, would help to underpin uh, and strengthen work uh, already underway. So, uh, in, in short, uh, we'll absolutely give that consideration. Thank you, First Minister. Right, thanks. <coughs> right, we're going to move on to broadly under the environment theme. Uh, I'm going to invite uh, Finlay Carson, Convener, Rural Affairs and Islands Committee. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good afternoon, First Minister. Can I ask uh, how the Scottish Government will achieve its vision for agriculture through the much anticipated Agriculture Bill? I think it is much uh, anticipated, and what we're very keen to do uh, with that bill um, is ensure that we work alongside our agricultural community to provide a level of stability. Um, and look, I'm not going to get into all the kind of arguments in our own Brexit or not, but one thing, of course, I think we can probably all agree on is that being part of the EU scheme uh, when we were members of the European Union allowed a level of certainty around longer term funding, which we just don't have at the moment. So we'll, we'll look to see how the bill can provide a level of stability around longer term funding, uh, which will be really uh, important to our agricultural community. The second area, which, of, which is of great importance, I know, to our farmers and to those involved in agricultural industries is ensuring that we uh, create uh, a sustainable future for farming in particular. And therefore, um, from 2025 in particular, how do we use the subsidies, the payments that are made, how do we use those in order to further our collective <coughs> net zero aims and net zero ambitions? And I think we can do that in a way that is phased um, and, and, and in a way that, as I say, is done in conjunction with, as opposed to simply imposed upon um, farmers and those in our agricultural uh, industries. Um, uh, Finlay Carson is right to say it's much anticipated and allude to the fact that um, uh, it, it, it should be uh, it, it should be introduced imminently, and it will be introduced imminently. We had a further discussion about the agriculture bill at cabinet just this week, so um, that bill uh, will come forward uh, imminently. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I think a lot of the agricultural sector will take exception to the word subsidy. I hope we're moving away from there and its support for for food production, but. Given, given the funding, you touched on funding, and currently there's a unique situation that exists with regards to ring fencing uh, funding that comes from the UK government, and we've had that uh, guaranteed for the last seven years, specifically for agriculture. So what thought is the Scottish Government given to introducing uh, multi-year funding, such as that the Welsh Government has done, to protect agricultural funding, particularly given the significant role that agriculture is currently playing? but uh, more importantly will play in delivering food security, climate change and uh, enhancing biodiversity. So, uh, I'm very favourable to looking at what, we can, what certainty we can give to multi-year um, funding. I think it's necessary, I think it's required, I think it gives the sector uh, a level of stability and certainty, which as I say, um, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced they would say that that has been given to them um, since our exit from the European Union. Um, so it's absolutely important and it's uh, absolutely uh, a, a, an issue of consideration uh, as we bring forward the bill. Thanks, Finlay. Uh, right, we're going to move on to the um, health theme now. And I'm going to invite uh, Claire Hockey, Convener, Health, Social Care and Support Committee. Claire. Thank you, Convener, and good afternoon, First Minister. Uh, the Health, Social Care and Support Committee recently took evidence on the NHS and social care winter planning. And the importance of the adult social care workforce in winter planning was quite rightly emphasised by many stakeholders, by officials and the Cabinet Secretary. And the recruitment and retention of the social care workforce was raised in both written and oral evidence. So can the First Minister advise what work needs to be undertaken to support the implementation of the commi commitment to a pay uplift for the adult social care workforce as outlined in the programme for government and how it's anticipated that this will benefit the workforce in the sector? 
First Minister. So again, this is an issue of, 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 of great uh, complexity and, and, and one that uh, if the uh, convener of Clare Hockey wishes, she uh, can come back to me if there's further detail that she uh, wishes, because um, in the interest of brevity, I'll try to cover just the key salient points. Um, pay is absolutely an issue. So everybody we talk to in social care will tell us that um, they are in a very competitive labour market. Um, they will often be losing people out, pe losing losing people from social care and adult social care in particular, to a whole host of sectors, from retail to the NHS to, to many other uh, sectors, and that's why it was important for me in the programme for government to be able to signal that from uh, April next year uh, we will uh, uh, give a significant pay uplift. That comes in the back of. The fact that we've already seen an, incre uh, an increase uh, to, to a minimum of £10.90 per hour uh, from April of this year, uh, in line with the real living wage uh, rate, um, and, and, and that uh, minimum pay uh, represents a, a almost 15% increase for those workers uh, in the last two years. But also, let me be absolutely honest, I've heard from the sector too that they feel that that pay uplift should have been made uh, today, should have been made uh, at the time of the programme for government uh, uh, announcement. Um, and I wish we could have done that. But given the significant financial pressures that we are under, that just is not possible. But I completely understand uh, why the sector uh, would want us to make that investment uh, now. So I do hear the sector in terms of some of their frustrations and even disappointment uh, that that uplift hasn't happened uh, immediately. The other issue I would point to is... Um, terms and conditions. So pay is, of course, important. I think it's probably the number one factor. But I think terms and conditions are important. So we do have, as uh, I think Clear Hockey is, is aware of, um, uh, a group uh, looking at fair work within social care. Um, and there are some uh, further actions that we can take in relation to fair work and social care, which I think are really important. And career progression, hugely important uh, uh, as well. And that's why I'm absolutely committed to the National Care Service. It's not uh, the panacea to all of the issues that we face uh, in social care, but it will greatly help in terms of pay, terms and conditions, sectoral bargaining, ethical commissioning. I think all of these issues will help uh, in relation to have a really thriving social care sector um, and one that is absolutely vital. Um, you know, social care is, is, is important and it's absolutely its own right. Um, but we know it's important also in order to help us with an NHS recovery uh, as well. Yeah. <coughs> Thank the First Minister for, for that answer. I'm going to move on to, to another um, subject, if I may. So the, the Joint Committee on Tackling Drug Deaths and Drug Harm met yesterday. Um, and there was, as you can imagine, there was a great deal of discussion about the establishment of a safe consumption facility pilot, which I believe was approved this morning by authorities in Glasgow. Unfortunately, the Minister uh, was unwell and unable to answer questions yesterday. So can I ask the First Minister if he can provide an update on plans for the Glasgow City facility? What community engagement and consultation will be done both before and during the pilot process? And importantly, this was raised with the committee yesterday, how uh, the Scottish Government will ensure those with lived and living experience will be included in the development and the evaluation of the pilot. First Minister. Uh, can I thank uh, Clare Hockey for an exceptionally important question? Um, I've seen the news today that Glasgow has approved um, a safer drug consumption uh, facility. It's a decision I very much welcome. Uh, I also welcome the Lord Advocate's most recent statement in relation to prosecution policy in this regard as well. So I'm very grateful to Glasgow for moving at pace. And uh, let me say unequivocally the Scottish Government uh, is ready to stand uh, alongside Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership and our colleagues within local government to advance this proposition as quickly as we possibly can, obviously within the, the confines of the pilot that was proposed uh, and, and, and receive that uh, uh, statement of prosecution policy from the Lord Advocate. Um, and that extends to, for example, how we can provide funding uh, support uh, for that safer drug consumption uh, facility to, it will be for Glasgow to take forward, and I have no doubt in the discussions that we as a government have had with Glasgow thus far, they are very mindful of taking the community alongside us, um, and uh, alongside them, and also in taking forward uh, the views of those with lived uh, experience. And I think it's uh, appropriate for me to pay tribute to the likes of Peter Kraken and others who have spoken about their own experience 
uh, in this regard and have uh, frankly pushed us all to take uh, more actions in the face of an unacceptable drug death crisis. Um, I, when I, while I was in New York, primarily for, for Climate Week, I did take some time to speak to um, the New York State um, uh, uh, Commissioner for, for, for Health, for the Department of Health, uh, Dr. Asfan, and he had mentioned to me that uh, their experience of having safer drug consumption facilities in New York for the last 18 months, I believe, was that it was imperative to try to take the public with you as best you possibly could. And the second point he made, which is one that I know Glasgow are absolutely committed to, that it isn't just about the safer drug facility, consumption facility, it's also about all the services that are co-located and wrapped around that. Um, and uh, I believe that New York are going to be publishing some uh, data from the first uh, 18 months uh, of uh, the safer drug consumption facility, uh, and, and that's been promised to be shared with us and the Scottish Government, and, and I'm sure uh, we can then share with, with Glasgow. Um, but it certainly it seems to have been a, a helpful and positive experience in, in New York as being one tool as part of a wider <coughs> effort to reduce drug deaths. Thank you. Thanks very much. I think we're going to stick with this theme. I'm going to move <coughs> over and invite back in Audrey Nicholl. Audrey. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, indeed, I, I am going to stay with, the, with this theme, uh, and I would follow up um, from the comments that uh, and the question that Claire Hawhey asked around uh, the. Uh, Lord Advocate's recent statement uh, and obviously the, the news today in relation to safe consumption rooms. But I also would like to ask about wider questions um, that this has raised regarding um, support for people using such a facility with particular regard to their continued contact with organised crime to source their drug of use. Th there is consensus, obviously, that a public health approach is the right approach in Scotland. However, I wonder if the, can, the First Minister can outline how the Scottish Government might take account of this issue with, within the safe consumption and pilot in such a way that provides a holistic response that in time might support the elimination uh, of the need uh, for individuals to maintain links with organised crime in supplying their drug of use. And I'm interested on, in the comments that the First Minister made about the work in New York. First Minister. Well, that's such an exceptionally uh, important question, a really good question uh, to, to, to ask. Um, I don't have the Lord Advocate's uh, statement uh, in front of me, but uh, certainly from, from memory, um, the Lord Advocate was very uh, precise and focused in the language that she used. And of course, uh, she mentioned that um, it would not be in the public interest to prosecute for simple possession offences taking place in the pilot, and that is a quite a narrow, narrowly defined pilot uh, in Glasgow in relation to safer drug consumption uh, facilities. Um, and uh, making it clear, well, I think it made it clear that, that doesn't impact on prosecution out with that quite narrow yeah. definition. So the work, which I know Audrey Nichols is very familiar with uh, in relation to the Serious Organised Crime Task Force, that work uh, absolutely will continue in relation to um, those criminal gangs who seek to exploit um, uh, people's vulnerabilities uh, and uh, look to profit from the misery um, of uh, others and the misery of communities. So that work will continue, uh, I would suggest, unaffected by the uh, statement of prosecution policy from uh, the Lord Advocate. So we do take a public health approach when it comes to the issue of drugs deaths, but we know that Police Scotland and Credit goes to Police Scotland, uh, that their focus on tackling serious organised crime uh, has uh, reaped uh, many uh, rewards in terms of um, uh, breaking up some of those criminal gangs, but there is a significant amount of work um, still to do. I also just go back to the point I made uh, a moment ago to Claire Hockey, that the, the safer drug consumption facilities uh, in their own uh, uh, can of course be, be helpful, but the, the, the real value comes in having access to other services. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was a really strong message from um, the, the, the Commissioner uh, in New York. <coughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Audrey. Right, I'm now going to invite uh, Stuart McMillan, Convener of Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, to take over the next questions. Stuart. 
Thank you, uh, Convener. The First Minister, you announced a, a bill on judicial factors in the programme for government, which is uh, based on a Scottish Law Commission report and which we believe is likely to be a strong candidate to actually come to the Delegated uh, Powers and Law Reform Committee. Can you set out what benefits you believe this bill is actually going to bring about? Um, for the judicial factors, uh, Bill Bill, been aware of uh, for a, a number of years now. Um, first and foremost, before I go into judicial factors, I think it's important to say I think we've got to a better position when it comes to Scottish Law Commission bills. I think there was um, a concern about the flow coming from Scottish Law Commission through to actual legislation being passed <coughs> uh, by this Parliament. So I think we are in a better place. This will be a third uh, SLC bill uh, to be introduced to this Parliament uh, this session. Uh, in terms of uh, judicial factors, um, the issue around judicial factors is not a new one. It's got a long history in Scottish law, um, and, and there's a continuing need for uh, capable, um, knowledgeable, expert um, administrators to be appointed to manage the property of those who can't, uh, should not, or will not manage it properly uh, themselves. But the, the current law, as we know, is um, outdated. I think it would be fair to say it is over a century old, with no p new primary legislation specifically on judi judicial factors since um, uh, 1889. So the bill will aim to introduce a statutory framework which sets out clearly the essential features of the office of judicial factor uh, and the broad parameters within which it should operate. And it will be, uh, I think, of benefit to all those involved in judicial factories in, in whatever capacity. So the Scottish Law Commission consulted on this issue, made a number of recommendations, which the Scottish Government tested uh, in a further consultation. And uh, as I say, we're committed to bringing forward that, uh, that bill this year. Thank you. Thank you for that, First Minister. Just uh, on, the, uh, on the theme of the SLC bills, I mean, you're quite correct in terms of the, this is the, the, well, we're looking at the third bill um, when this uh, does come into the Parliament. Hopefully, it does come to the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Uh, and obviously, progress has been made. But can you uh, give a, an assurance uh, to the, uh, the, this uh, committee today that uh, the Scottish Government will continue uh, on that theme of bringing forward more SLC bills? Yes, uh, simply I can. Uh, I think it's uh, we've got into a better rhythm of, of doing that over over the years, especially since changes were made in 2013. This will be the eighth bill uh, to be introduced. Uh, sorry, there's already been uh, eight bills introduced since those rules were updated uh, in 2013. And, and you'll know that uh, the government is considering a number of other SLC reports uh, during this uh, session, as were set out by uh, not my programme for government previous my predecessor's programme for government in 21-22. So, uh, yes, I think we're in a better place in that regard and we continue to look forward to continue working closely with the SLC uh, and, of course, with the appropriate committee in this regard. Thank you. I'm now going to move on and invite Jackson Taylor, <coughs> convener of the Citizens' Participation and Public Petitions Committee. Jackson. Uh, First Minister, as convener of this particular committee, it affords me the opportunity to bring directly to you uh, the aims of a particular petition and hopefully to banjax you into agreeing with the petitioner's ambitions. And uh, I do that again today. I, I acknowledge the statement this morning in relation to uh, ongoing support for asylum seekers. Uh, but we heard a petition, petition number 2028, from Pinar Aksu and Doha Abuamar, who are both, I think, aware that I'm raising this with you today, on concessionary bus travel for asylum seekers. Now, at the moment, um, of the 6,000 asylum seekers, roughly a third are probably able to claim because they're either under 22 or they're over 60. But it leaves about 4,000 people who are not. Now, I understand the difficulty uh, when it comes to benefits, but this is a concessionary scheme, and SPICE think it's entirely within the competence of the Scottish Government to extend free concessionary travel to this group. It was within the 22-23 programme for government, a specific reference to delivering a system, uh, a scheme whereby free concessionary travel would be available. It's not in the current programme for government. Um, but we've obviously heard from MSPs and from the community themselves who believe that an extension of this kind would be enormously valuable uh, to asylum seekers and their ability to, to live and operate within the community. And Paul Sweeney brought to the committee last week an example of, of one uh, asylum seeker who required dental treatment, couldn't afford the bus fare, had to walk 10 miles in the rain and in pain to secure the treatment that was otherwise available for him. Um, I don't want to throw figures around. It's been suggested it would be about half a million pounds. I, I don't know whether that's correct or not. But bluntly, I suppose, is this uh, an objective that the First Minister might like to commit to being able to deliver? 
but it's taken over an hour for the first banjaxing. <laughs> Minister. And if there's one issue that I should be banjaxed into, I think this is probably uh, a, a contender uh, for an issue that I absolutely should uh, give consideration to. We are actually actively giving consideration to this very, very issue. Uh, can I commend the petitioners as well? I know Pina in particular over a number of years has been uh, a vocal advocate for the rights of asylum seekers. Can I also say that Jackson Carlos' question uh, is particularly welcome on, on, on the back of some dreadful commentary uh, around uh, refugees uh, that we saw in the last 24 hours from the UK government. And, and I know Jackson Carlaw has uh, been often on the right side of issues in relation to asylum and, and refugees for a number uh, of years and kind of recognise that. Um, look, in, in short, we are open and not only open to this issue, uh, we'll, we are giving it active consideration. There are a number of complex challenges when it comes to, uh, in particular, what we are able to do in relation to asylum seekers, um, how they are uh, identified, um, how we can make a concessionary scheme work, but these are not insurmountable uh, if there is a desire to take forward these issues. So um, I, I can't say anything more other than uh, it has been an issue of live discussion uh, from uh, within government. Um, and if there is a, a way to, to do this, then I'm seeking um, uh, governments, uh, uh, then, then we are certainly seeking to do that. Um, but it, it does come with some complexities, which as I'm certain uh, Jackson Carla will be uh, aware of. You're on a roll, Jackson. Do you want any more? I'll shoot that as a yes. But <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll move uh, on now to Claire Adamson, who I think has got some questions in relation to culture policy. Okay. Thank you, Kavira. Uh, First Minister, if I could turn to the culture remit of our committee. In your mandate letter to the Cabinet Secretary, you <clears throat> state that Mr Robertson should collaborate with ministerial colleagues across government to mainstream culture into policy making. This is an aspiration and ambition that's been around for a long time, almost back to, to Christie, and uh, one that, not least, most recently, the published Culture and Communities Report from the committee has touched on as well. Um, so, do you agree that we need to see real progress in this area uh, to truly meet the ambitions and cross-portfolio funding for culture? And how do you see your role as First Minister in leading in this area to ensure that we meet the ambitions of a well-being society and a well-being economy? First Minister. I'm really grateful to uh, Claire Anderson for asking the question. And I, I go back to my point around the mandate letters, which has not been done before. And I know it can seem quite uh, almost an anarchy point uh, to make within uh, policy uh, development and delivery, but I think it is uh, really important um, that it's understood the reason for the mandate letters is to drive forward a real focus on delivery. And so each cabinet secretary is in no doubt whatsoever, and it's been done in collaboration with cabinet secretaries, but they're no doubt whatsoever about what the expectation, my expectation, and I, I believe now the public's expectation will be on what they deliver between now and 2026. And mainstreaming culture has got to be a, a part of that. Um, and, and what I've uh, asked Angus Robertson to do is consider uh, what structures need to be put in place with uh, fellow cabinet secretaries uh, and ministers in order to understand that they, they uh, equally understand the importance of mainstreaming culture within their uh, portfolio. So uh, Angus Robertson, is, in the first instance, has taken uh, forward a number of bilaterals. Um, I, I, I think with, with, with uh, if not all, uh, the vast majority of uh, cabinet secretaries around that very issue of mainstreaming uh, culture and uh, you know I can I can say from my previous most recent experiences health secretary there is huge amounts of synergy between what we're looking to do in relation to better health outcomes and in relation to um, uh, in relation to to, to culture um, you know think about social prescribing as one example of that and uh, in cabinet on, on Tuesday, uh, we had a, a, a post-cabinet discussion on child poverty, and of course, culture was a significant part of that discussion. Given, of course, the excellent work that a number of cultural organisations, such as Sistema, do uh, in relation to, 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 to child poverty, um, so I can give uh, Claire Anderson absolute assurance that this is being taken forward by Angus Robertson. He has my full. Um, support in taking forward these discussions uh, with cabinet colleagues, and it's now a case of putting in place the appropriate structures to make sure that that is uh, understood and delivered upon. Thank you, Mr. Minister. <coughs> Thanks very much. I'm now going to move on to uh, housing-related issues. I'm going to call back in Ariane Burgess. Ariane. Thanks very much. 
The program for government sets out the intention to introduce a housing bill, which will, amongst other things, make provisions for long-term rent controls. The emergency measures set out in last year's Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act will have expired before these long-term measures can take effect. Both tenants and lord, landlords need certainty about what will happen in this interim period as a matter of urgency. And the committee has had assurance, uh, has been assured that there will be uh, transitional provisions in place. But we would welcome the first minister's reassurances that this clarity for tenants and lord, landlords will be coming imminently. Uh, yes, it, it will be. It's an important point that Ariane Burgess raises around uh, the need for transitional arrangements and. You know, the, the fear, of course, is when these uh, current provisions expire, then there's a significant steep uh, increase uh, in rents, and that is something that I know worries a number of private uh, renters um, uh, in, 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 in particular. And the committee did hear uh, from the Minister for Zero Carbon uh, Buildings, Active Travel and Tenants' Rights uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we are very much looking at options for the effective use of the regulation making powers in Schedule 3 of the Cost of Living Act to temporarily, temporarily reform the current rent adjudication uh, process. Um, that regulation making power, of course, will be subject to the approval uh, of Parliament and uh, it will be crucial allowing us to temporarily alter the rent adjudication process um, to prevent unintended consequences as we transition out of the emergency measures uh, of uh, the Act. Uh, of course, uh, continued discussions with stakeholders, uh, including uh, landlords, uh, will be uh, incredibly important. Uh, and we hope to be able to introduce proposals in uh, certainly in due course uh, shortly, in fact, uh, uh, after uh, the current extension uh, takes uh, place. But I, I would just uh, point again to the, the words of uh, Patrick Harvey uh, uh, in, in, in this regard, um, that an adjustment to the rent adjudication process will prevent an immediate cliff edge um, when the temporary emergency legislation uh, expires. And uh, that is absolutely right uh, and proper. Nobody, nobody wants uh, that kind of cliff edge uh, for anybody uh, that is uh, uh, renting in Scotland. Thank you. And Colette Stevenson. Um, thanks, Convener and um, First Minister. It would be no surprise that I'm going to focus in again on um, child poverty um, and what more can be done to reduce the number of children living in temporary accommodation just now. There is a significant amount of work for us to do in relation to children and temporary accommodation. Unfortunately, the latest statistics uh, show the trajectory moving in the wrong direction. That's not acceptable. Uh, we've got to take our share of the responsibility in that regard, uh, which we absolutely uh, do. Um, so, uh, Colette Stevenson, I know, will absolutely be aware of the work that we uh, have done in relation to the temporary accommodation task uh, and finish group. Um, and we are committed, absolutely committed, uh, with, without any exception, um, to act on uh, the recommendations of that group. And that includes investing at least £60 million uh, for councils and social landlords to acquire properties to use as social homes, um, asking social landlords to increase allocation to homeless uh, households and supporting councils facing the greatest temporary accommodation pressures to develop uh, targeted uh, plans. So, so we will uh, not rest uh, until we uh, absolutely uh, make progress in reducing significantly the use of temporary accommodation, because as I say, I'm afraid the latest statistics show um, a worrying uh, trend and a worrying number of families and children in temporary accommodation, and that's not acceptable. Thanks, Colin. Right. Um, just to give time <coughs> for colleagues to think up any last questions you have, I'm going to invite Kenneth Gibson to ask. Uh, thank question. you very much uh, for your indulgence, Convener. Um, First Minister, Westminster, Holyrood, local government, health boards, community planning partnerships, joint integration boards, regional and city deals, 150 or so quangos, an increasing number of commissioners, as we'll see this very day, and a board to oversee the National Care Service. Um, that's a lot for a country of 5.4 million people. So I'm just wondering what steps the Scottish Government will take to reform and declutter this very crowded public sector landscape. First Minister. So uh, the member will be aware that the Deputy First Minister has res responsibility for public sector reform. Uh, I think that is 
uh, an important uh, role uh, for the Deputy First Minister to have, given she obviously has the finance brief, and that's deliberate. Uh, and I think uh, we are very mindful of the fact that uh, it can be quite a complex landscape for the public to navigate. Um, so uh, that work is being undertaken uh, by the Deputy First Minister. She's involving all Cabinet Secretaries that are relevant and appropriate and Ministers that are relevant and appropriate through uh, a regular meetings, cross-portfolio uh, meetings uh, that uh, take place. So uh, we recognise that there's a need to simplify uh, and ensure that we are as efficient as possible, particularly in a challenging financial uh, landscape. Uh, but I also make um, no apologies whatsoever for ensuring that at the heart of our uh, principles is fair work and ensuring those in the public sector are paid well, paid fairly uh, for the exceptional job they do uh, right across the public sector. Thanks. Uh, I was also going to ask um, on another topic, um, what discussions has the First Minister had with the UK Government over any guidance on the role of civil servants working in the devolved administrations regarding the delivery of manifesto commitments? Minister. Oh, well, I'm certain uh, the member is aware of the uh, uh, various interventions from uh, members of the House of Commons, members of the House of Lords and even UK government ministers, certainly alluding to the fact that uh, the Scottish Government uh, shouldn't be doing work that we have a mandate for, in particular in relation to the Constitution. Um, we have, uh, of course, uh, since the Supreme Court judgment, uh, have clear guidance uh, from the Permanent Secretary uh, around, of course, uh, what work uh, we can uh, do. Uh, and, of course, I'll just uh, quote from uh, John Paul uh, Marks, Permanent Secretary in the Finance and Public Administration Committee on the 16th of May of this year. Uh, we serve the government of the day. Uh, that includes with regards to constitutional reform. It has been well understood under devolution for many years that the civil service uh, in the Scottish Government serves the Scottish Government as priorities. and We provide policy advice, including the development of the prospectus paper series for the government to set out its constitutional uh, objective. So uh, we know that our excellent civil service uh, will work, uh, of course, uh, in an impartial, apolitical manner, uh, but will provide uh, assistance and support to the government of the day uh, for the objectives that it has been uh, elected, uh, the mandate has been given and, and, and the manifesto commitments uh, that it has made. And uh, there can be no uh, doubt or dubiety about the fact uh, that this, uh, the party uh, I lead uh, has a clear mandate uh, for a referendum on independence, and that's something we'll continue to pursue. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Uh, You won't be surprised to know that uh, you've sparked late interest in further questions. I'm going to come first to Claire Adams and then to Richard Leonard. Claire. Thank you very much. Um, uh, my colleague Sue Weber raised um, uh, the issue of behaviour in schools, and you touched on all the um, issues post-COVID and, and understanding of all of this, but obviously educational reform is on the agenda of the government going for, forward. In the summer, I hosted as part of the Festival of Politics a quick Q and answer session in the chamber with Gustavo Dudamel, and we had the El Sistema graduates from the number of years and all the El Sistema projects from across Scotland in the gallery and to hear the inspirational transformation that that had made to these young people was um, simply inspiring. So can I ask the, the First Minister, how will you ensure that projects we know work that make a difference to young people will be embedded going forward as we look to, to reform some of these issues in our education system. I think this goes to the heart of the work I've asked um, the Finance Secretary to do and, and, and the Cabinet to do more broadly, which is we know that the financial circumstances we find ourselves in are very challenging. I've been in government for uh, 11 odd years and I've never seen the, the, the finances, the public finances as constrained and difficult and challenging. And that's not just the Scottish Government. Um, one only has to look at the measures the Welsh Government have brought forward, for example, and I've got tremendous uh, good relationships and constructive relationships with uh, the Welsh uh, Government. Um, but the fact that they've, uh, I think, put every health board uh, into, into special measures around governance and, and finance um, it just as a demonstration of how difficult financial circumstances are right across devolved governments. So that is why I've asked the Cabinet and, and again the Deputy First Minister to spearhead the work around 
targeting and ensuring that our focus is that, that every penny we spend is going to those people who need it the most. Now, in order to do that, we have to make sure we have the, the, the requisite data that tells us what works, um, what uh, interventions are significantly helping us in relation to the targets we've got in regards to poverty and child poverty in particular. And I, I do commend the programmes uh, like Sistema. I've seen the big noise uh, myself in, uh, in Dundee uh, during a, a visit to, to Claypots Castle uh, Primary School uh, not too long ago. So um, if I can give Clay Adamson an assurance that piece of work is very much underway around <clears throat> what targeted interventions can help, what do we need to scale up, and, and that will also involve difficult decisions, and, and we'll get to that during the budget in relation to other things that we might not be able to do or we might have to reprofile, um, and that will be a really difficult discussion to have, um, but we'll, we're, we're, we're not shying away from those difficult decisions because they, be, they have to take place, as I say, given the... Uh, really difficult financial circumstances we find ourselves in. Thanks. I'm Richard Leonard. Uh, thanks, First Minister, last year the Scottish Government paid £30 million out to the consulting industry. Uh, that's more in that year than the previous four years put together. Uh, at least some of those consultancies insist on non-disclosure agreements the Public Audit Committee uh, discovered. Doesn't that prove one of your Council of Economic Advisers right when she says that the consulting industry is the big con, infertilising our governments, warping our economies, and significantly in the context of transparency, obfuscating political accountability. So can I uh, tell you where I disagree uh, with that uh, quote, is that um, where we can provide the expertise within government, we absolutely will seek to do that. There's always the default position. Where we need further expertise, using consultants is something that is done by governments, again, right across the UK, whether it's the Welsh uh, Labour government, whether it's the Scottish government, UK government, and of course, <coughs> uh, the government in Northern Ireland uh, as well. And we will try to limit that spend where we can. £30 million pounds is not an insignificant uh, amount. I, I accept that. It is a fraction of our resource budget, um, it would be fair to say. So uh, we try to limit uh, where we can. <laughs> Um, I would need to look at the specific details of uh, all of that spend in order to, to, to give a, an individual commentary on each amount uh, that was spent. In terms of non-disclosure uh, agreements, NDAs, uh, we uh, really, uh, again, have a default position of not uh, using uh, them. Where NDAs uh, are sometimes entered into is because of issues around commercial sensitivity. Uh, in relation to, for example, Ferguson's uh, shipyard. Um, and, and, and that is to protect the commercial interests uh, of a particular entity uh, so that it can be competitive uh, in the marketplace. Um, and if the NDA wasn't there, then that would potentially uh, jeopardise that commercial sensitivity. Um, but I think the points that Richard Leonard makes uh, broadly are absolutely right, and government should be very aware uh, and wary of the spend that they uh, that they that they uh, make in relation to consultants. But, but in, in, re in relation to that specific example, the NDA was insisted upon by the consultancy, not by uh, Ferguson Marine. Uh, but, but again, uh, that may, uh, from the detail I have seen, when it comes to the NDA that exists between Ferguson's Marine uh, and uh, the, the consultants involved, um, that was there to protect commercial sensitivity. And the concern is that um, it, would, it would work against the competitiveness of Ferguson's um, if uh, there wasn't, uh, uh, if, if that the report was published. Uh, and published uh, in full. So that's my understanding, uh, certainly, of the position of the NDA between Ferguson's um, and the consultant when it comes to any uh, non disclosure agreements we're involved in. Um, it will be often when it is, for example, the sharing of sensitive uh, material. But I, I take the point that um, Richard Leonard makes uh, and that he, he quotes uh, in that. Um, we should be as open and transparent about our use of consultants and the reports that they publish. I've now got a couple of unfinalies. <coughs> I suspect Stuart's is on this issue. Is, um, is it? Uh, I'll come to Stuart first and then Colette, but they'll have to be, have to be brief. Sure. Thanks, no, no, thank you. It's not regarding DNAs, but it certainly is about the, the shipyard. Uh, as, uh, First Minister, has the Scottish Government uh, any 
uh, needed to taking a, a final decision regarding a direct award to Ferguson Shipyard. Uh, it's still under consideration. Thank you. I'm Colette Stevenson. Hey, thanks very much for uh, convener and uh, First Minister, you announced in the programme for government a number of measures aimed at tackling poverty, such as the removal of income thresholds um, from the Best Start Foods programme. But to address the root causes of poverty, interventions are clearly required at reserve level as well. Can you elaborate on how urgent and essentials guarantee from the UK government to adequately cover the cost of essentials like food? transport and energy aligns with the Scottish Government's missions to reduce inequality and child poverty as well. Uh, given uh, the time, I'm happy again to furnish Scott Stevenson if there's any further detail, points of detail that she uh, wishes to receive. Um, the essential gra Essentials Guarantee uh, is an idea that has been brought forward by um, a number of anti-poverty organisations, uh, Joseph Rowntree Foundation in particular, it's called on the UK Government, to immediately set the Universal Credit Standard Allowance at uh, £120 uh, per week for a single adult and £200 uh, for a couple for 23-24. Um, and doing so would have some very real impacts on the UK population, uh, according to the Foundation. Um, over 8 million families would see their incomes rise on average by £48 uh, per week. Um, over half of working age families in the UK with a disabled family member would benefit, uh, and almost 70% of people in poverty uh, being able to pay for essentials with three and five whom are already working families, so it's a significant intervention. It's why we add our weight to the voice. It, uh, we add our weight to the voices that are calling for an essentials guarantee. But we also mm. uh, accept that it doesn't abdicate us of our responsibility uh, in terms of the devolved powers that we have, and hence why we've used those devolved powers, social security powers, taxation powers. Uh, I believe to 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 um, move us into a positive direction in relation to tackling poverty and child poverty, in particular with the Scottish Child Payment um, perhaps being the most um, uh, the, the most uh, obvious and deliberate um, example uh, of a game-changing intervention that can help and assist in relation to poverty here in Scotland. OK, I'm going to wind it up there. Thank you very much indeed. That concludes uh, the meeting. Can I thank very much uh, the First Minister for his attendance, um, not least um, Struggling through man flu, which I know from personal experience can be hugely debilitating. Um, I hope we can, uh, we can reprise this in about six months' time and we will be in touch with your office about scheduling a date for that, First Minister. But that concludes the meeting. The next meeting will be after the October recess on the 25th of October. So thank you all for your participation and I close this meeting. Thank you. Thank you.